what a way for the Beatles to go out. Uh, Abbey Road was just, it was their swan song. Uh, I read the other day, there was a headline that came out that said, Abbey Road was the ultimate mic drop for an artist to come out with. Uh, and it certainly was. So anyway, I'm super excited about this collection. Um, I have had to come up with a lot of restraint to not do a lot of sneak peeks and hear things before. Uh, of course, I've kept kept up with the early releases. So when they came out with uh, something, the remixed version, and when they came out with the strings only mix, and then they came out with Come Together, and then the, what is it, Take Five, that they came out with, that's here in the box set. So I've listened to those, heard a couple of other tracks on Chris Carter's Breakfast with the Beatles show that airs on Sirius. Shout out to him. Uh, what a great program. And today was a huge, huge celebration of this, of this collection. Uh, go figure, right? I mean, it would make sense that they would wait until today. Um, but there were some things along the way, you know, and I couldn't help but listen. But I have not dug in, even though all this stuff is on the streaming service, and it has been probably since midnight local time. Um, I really wanted to kind of wait. And I want to take this in. So also, another thing I have not done, I have not researched this soup to nuts. And I've done that on purpose. I really want to enjoy this process. Um, just like any other fan. You know, I feel like doing what I'm doing with this channel, like there's so many things that I, I feel like I have to stay on top of. The latest news and what's coming in, uh, what's coming out next year. Let's talk about Let It Be. Let's talk about all this stuff. And there's a certain part of me that is like, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not just a hardcore fan. Like, I like the history. I like the research. I like the scholarship behind all this stuff. And I try to keep up with it and try to keep tabs on it as much as possible. But there are plenty of days where I just want to be a fan and I just want to listen to the music. So that's where I'm at. Um, let me holler at the chat real quick. Again, if you're watching this live, what's up? There's a, it says 42 folks in here right now, which is awesome. That's a lot of fun. Um, but if you're watching this after the fact, I think if you're watching it on YouTube, like if you're on youtube.com, you can actually play the live chat replay alongside this. I don't know. Somebody else might have to school me on that, but I think you can do that. Um, but I'll leave it up here on the Fab Four Archives channel in perpetuity. This is the third unboxing that I've done. I did Sgt. Pepper in 2017, did White Album last year. So now we've got this one going on. So um, yeah, yeah, it's fun doing this stuff and hanging out with you guys. Um, chat room, everybody saying, what's up? George Toon says, hello from Britain. Hello from Miami. We see Brazil in there. Hello from Earth. That's that's nice that we don't have any Martians tonight. I mean, they, they would be welcome, though. Yeah. Yeah. Open it already. Richard Alexander says, open it already. Okay, okay. I will say, though, this will be a slow burn. This is going to be a long process. This is not a just 10 minutes, let me fly through it. Um, again, I want to enjoy this stuff. And the unboxing process is part of it for me. So, I mean, there are, I've seen other videos out there. People have already done unboxings. Uh, there are many like mine, but this one's mine. So I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to do everything slowly at my pace. I posted this on the uh, YouTube community post earlier. I don't know if you can see it. There's a label for it. That's kind of cool. Made in Germany. Makes me wonder why that stuff is made in Germany. Uh, is it just typical German high quality stuff? Or uh, I don't know. Did they make them all over the world? And I happen to get a German issue. Now this white balance. I don't know what's up with this. But you see how everything just got kind of orangey? So I'll work on that. But uh, yeah, there we go. Let me get this out of the way. I guess what I can do, this worked last time, to kind of reset the balance. Does that work? I don't know. Still kind of orangey, but I'll tell you what, even looking at it in person versus here on the monitor, like John's suit, the stripes on the road, they are not pure white. It's a cream. So that's just naturally it anyway. If you look up here, this text, and I guess that's about right. Um, it's a bright white. So yeah, this is it. Shrink wrap, the sticker. This says the Beatles, and then it has the logo here, or the uh, Abbey Road Crossing logo. The Beatles Anniversary Edition, new mix by Giles Martin and Sam O'Kell, as we all around here knew. Two session CDs featuring previously unreleased studio outtakes, demos, and studio chat. Blu-ray featuring surround sound mix in Dolby Atmos 
and 5.1 surround plus high-res stereo. There's that spine there. So yeah, all this of course mimics the LP box. I mean, I, without measuring it, I mean, I would say it's pretty close to LP size anyway. That's that spine. Looks like they're all about the same. Abbey Road, Beatles, Anniversary Edition. Yeah. All right. No fancy knife. I think, I think for a previous collection, I used my grandfather's pocket knife. Very classic, very old school. But that's in the fancy blue bowl over there in the kitchen. So I'm going to scrap that for now. Do it this way. So the only thing that I really want to keep, and I've, I've done this for years with CDs, I kind of like keeping these labels, just cause, right? I mean, a box set like this is not something that you pull out every single day anyway. So it's kind of fun to keep extras, um, especially things that people might otherwise not keep. So I'll hang on to that little sticker and put it with the set and pull it out whenever. This is the Super Deluxe Edition. Um, so they came out with a few different versions. So they've got the, the remix version, which is just the plain CD, which is one CD. Amazon has it for like 13 bucks right now. I think I put a link in the description to just that plain version uh, if you're interested in just hearing the remix, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit. Um, but then there, are, this is the Anniversary Edition, the Super Deluxe box set, blah, 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 all the terminology that they come up with. Um, but this is it. This is, you know, the, the Cadillac version. Um, you know, unless you want to consider the vinyl version. So this is the CD version. It does come with the Blu-ray that has the 5.1 mix on it, all that stuff. Um, but if you got the vinyl version, somebody can correct me wrong if I'm wrong in the chat, but I believe the vinyl version comes with the 2019 remix and then there is either one more record or maybe two more records that come uh, that have the, the studio outtakes. So nothing new here on the front cover. It's the classic front cover, but it's beautiful. You know, this is not a sticker that's like pasted onto the box there. That's printed straight onto the box. Well done. Um, with Pepper, if you go back to the 2017 Pepper box set, it had that lenticular cover that kind of Gave you that 3D effect if you would do that. Nothing like that here. Pretty cut and dry. Pretty much what you would expect. So there's the back cover. Again, this is this is what we would expect. Um, really mimicking, you know, the releases going back 50 years, except for things like you know the Blu-ray logo, and then anytime where it's talking about Dolby Atmos uh, 5.1, and then of course the track listing here. It actually breaks down. The, uh, the sessions and the outtakes and, and, and all that that you're hearing. One thing to note, Abbey Road, the actual track listing from the original pressings, not later pressings, but the original pressings, did not have Her Majesty on there. It was truly, truly treated like the, uh, the hidden track. So going back to my 90s kids, y'all rem remember listening to CDs, and CDs would sometimes fly through a few things, and then you'd have this bonus track tacked on the end of it. Her Majesty was always that. Uh, or was that at the beginning, but uh, yeah, so it's actually labeled on here now. Just one second to see if there's anything else in here. Anything that's new? I mean, just Blu-ray, Atmos, um, specifics, specs, 96 kilohertz, 24-bit high-res stereo, 1080p, 20, 23.98 frames per second, aspect ratio 16 by 9, all this stuff that if you even uh, dip your toe in the world of video, none of this stuff will be a surprise to you. And of course, there is no video content on the Blu-ray. It's just the 5.1 mix and the Atmos mix. But yeah, I'm not going to read all the session, or uh, all the specific tracks that are on the session discs. Um, you know, as we go through the box set, as we look through the book, we'll talk about that a little bit. No surprises here on the Blu-ray audio. It's just the straight up track listing. So let's dig in. Um, this has not only the discs, but it has this book that comes along with it too that holds the discs in there. Uh, nothing else, nothing else of note in the box. 
Really thick, nice box though. That thing ain't even going anywhere. All right, here we go, page one. So it's doing the thing again. It seems like anytime I hold something up to the camera, everything gets really orangey. Like my hand is not orange, believe it or not. So there are the discs that come when you first open it. There's the Blu-ray and Abbey Road 2019 mix. So, <coughs> excuse me. So maybe some uh, introductory thoughts on the uh, the remix thing. I've really enjoyed the remixes that they have done with Sgt. Pepper and with White Album. I'm not a crazy purist um, because I do believe that from the purist standpoint, you know, if you if you want the original mixes, if you want the original masterings, if you want the original mix with a really clean and recent remaster, you can get that. Now, if you want a remix, which purportedly sounds better and more up to date and fresher and crisper and all the you know fancy words that audiophiles want to put on this stuff, if you want that with modern remastering, of course, then you've got that. So you've got all the different options. So the little purist heart in me is kind of like, okay, I don't want you to mess with the mix too much, which really tells me that I'm probably in the camp of the 2009 remasters will always, from the point that they came out, I think they have become the standard for, for what we're looking at in, in Beatles tunes. I think, um, I think they are truest to the original mixes in most cases, uh, truest to the uh, original desires and everything, but the remixes are fun. I think the remixes have a place. And, um, you know, sound systems in the year 2019 are drastically different than sound systems in 1969. And certainly, if you want to go back to 64 and some of the remixes that they, they touched for the Love soundtrack, uh, and certainly later, I'm trying to think of which ones were two-track versus four-track, where they couldn't play with them too much. Um, but... Yeah, remixing is kind of a funny thing. You know, I'm not squarely in one camp or the other. I think it's okay. I like having options. I like having all this stuff out there. I cannot believe that there's still Beatles product. I can't believe that, that there are 50 people in a live chat room watching me unbox this in 2019. The band has been broken up for 50, almost 50 years. Like, it's a blast that we still get to party like this and still celebrate and still have a reason to in a lot of cases. Um, so I enjoy that. But I think for me, I will always come back to the 2009 remasters. Uh, really, I grew up on the 87 CD masters, which are fine, but they're comfortable for me. I don't think they necessarily best represent um, the Beatles and the sound that they were going for. So anyway, let me pop back into the chat real quick to make sure you guys aren't going, no, the, the chat died or the stream died or whatever. Richard Kenmore says, thinking about buying this tonight, this is a lot of fun. Alex, the crazy kid says, I'm so glad they put Her Majesty in the middle of the long one again. Um... So actually, and you probably know this, and I'm sure other folks in here know this, the long, well, let's talk about it. We'll talk about it when we get in here a little bit more, but the long one was actually the, uh, the draft mix, if you want to say, you know, the, the rough mix where they said, okay, let's assemble this. Let's see what these 16 minutes sound like. And it was before the orchestral overdubs, but I think for the most part, everything else was there. I think they had, um, Somebody will fill me in on the chat I, because I haven't listened to it. And I listened to the long one. I've got it on a bootleg somewhere, but I haven't yet listened to it in this collection. So I can't recall. Like, does the end have um, the full finished guitar solos on there? Or is it just kind of the backing track before they went in there and added them? So anyway, uh, back to the chat. Michael Gray still it says, still waiting for mine. Oh, man. Yeah, it'll come. Are you waiting for it today? I hope you get it today, man. Tony Fox says they expect you to buy vinyl and CDs. Yeah. Yeah, you know, options are good, right? Katie TLC says the Beatles made me happy and everyone happy, and I was born in 2006. That's awesome. All right. I'm going to put this back off to the side, and let's go into the collection a little bit more. Man, again, I'm sorry about this white balance thing, y'all. Wish I could figure it out. It's a... Uh, the camera was fine when I was testing all this stuff earlier. So again, what you're seeing, a little oranger, like my hands aren't orange, right? Um, 
So I don't know what's up with that. I don't know. I wonder if we get to a white. Yeah, let's see. Did you see that? Did you see it? It changed. So if we go back to that, yeah, it's this page that's throwing it off. Funny. Anyway, I digress. Abbey Road 2019 mix. This is the remix. This is not the 2009 mix. This is not, there is no mono mix for Abbey Road. If you think back to the Sgt. Pepper box set, it came out with the original 67 mono mix as part of the box set. There was no mono mix for Abbey Road. It was always stereo. It was made for stereo. So there's no mono mix to, to consider or to include for something like this. So 2019 mix and the Blu-ray audio. The Beatles, The Abbey Road. It's that classic shot that Apple used in their iTunes campaign. If you recall that when the Beatles hit iTunes, I just felt like that, that picture was everywhere. The Beatles, Abbey Road, forward by Paul McCartney, intro by Giles Martin. The Route, or Route, depending on where you're from, to Abbey Road by Kevin Hallett. Track by track, Kevin Hallett. The cover, Kevin Hallett. The Arrival of Abbey Road by Kevin Hallett. In the end, and in the end, by David Hepworth. Kevin Hallett is a rock star when it comes to the stuff. He's written many, many essays for the band before, um, and he literally wrote the book on the Beatles live at the BBC. So to say that he knows the Beatles is an understatement. Great shots here with a little note right here that these photos were taken by Linda McCartney. Man, amazing, amazing shots, right? John on the casino. Paul on the Rick bass. George on his Gibson. We can go on drums. No tea towels in that shot, but uh, I'm sure there are other shots in here that probably do show them. Kind of a sidebar, but this guitar has an interesting story. Look it up sometime, or I don't know, maybe I'll make a video about it sometime. This is possibly the same exact guitar that is on the cover of Bob Dylan's Nashville Skyline. I think Bob's like tipping his hat or doing something like that with this guitar. And there's a story and there's a little bit of a, not a conspiracy theory, but rumors and nobody's ever really done the history and the homework the last I checked. I don't know, maybe that stuff has been found out since then. Um, but that guitar got passed around a little bit. And supposedly that was, um, that was heavily used on this record. There were some other records. Uh, it was heavily used on the White Album. Um, yeah, so it was everywhere. Another great shot by Linda McCartney there. Forward by Paul. And then I will read this later. Uh, I won't read this whole thing to you guys. That's not necessarily what an unboxing is. But it's dated 2019. So it's cool that Paul kicks this off. Intro by Giles Martin. I will read this first little paragraph to kind of set the tone for it from Giles's point of view. My first in-depth work for the Beatles was the creation of a soundtrack for the Cirque du Soleil Love Show. Over 13 years later, my most enduring memories from that time are the playbacks have come together on separate days for Paul and Ringo. Their reactions were the same. Each closed his eyes as he listened, then turned to me and said, I remember that day. And then added with a smile, we were really good that day. This is what Abbey Road is for me, a band at the height of its powers. Time and Beatlemania may have eroded some of the youthful spirit of earlier years, but the complexity of the playing and the consummate ease with which they could attack any musical genre had reached a zenith. Wow. Well said. More photos by Linda McCartney. Paul at the piano. Ringo singing. You know, I've seen a lot of Beatles photo, photos, especially Beatles in the studio photos. And some of these look new to me. Now, not, you know, I've seen those before, right? And you probably have too. I'm not sure if we've seen these before. Like, I don't remember. I don't know. I don't know. I'm doubting myself a little bit. I don't remember seeing some of these in color, I think. Rick has said, I got mine today. You got your set. Awesome, man. Have you torn into it? Maybe torn is the wrong word. Nobody's going to tear into this. But uh, have you opened it up, unboxed it yourself? Are you enjoying it? And like I said, an unboxing is a very different experience than taking in the whole thing. So I'll grab the CD. I'll pop it in my old school Discman. I'll put on some good headphones later on. And I'll, uh, 
I'll take it in properly. I'll take in the whole thing because it's about the music anyway, right? But all this stuff, kind of like my videos here on this channel, on the Fat Four Archivist channel, anytime I can give context to, to songs, to the way that they were written, to stories behind who played on what, whatever it is, for me anyway, and I think for a lot of people who really appreciate my work, that extra context makes you appreciate the music even more. And it's kind of like remix versus remaster versus the old school stuff. It's out there as an option. If you don't like it, don't watch it. If you don't like it, don't listen to it. So for me right now, the unboxing is enjoying this book, looking at the mixes, again, trying to get some context on all this. The route to Abbey Road. So there's the back cover shot. A little bit of a mystery on who this lady is. Um, there are some theories. I saw a photo the other day and it was supposedly Paul. I think it was taken before the record came out. So it would have been a pre-release version. Um, of Abbey Road and I think Paul was looking at the record and he had a had a young lady next to him and she was also holding a copy of the record if I recall this correctly looking at the back cover and so somebody threw it out there this was on Facebook in a, a Beatles group that I'm a part of somebody threw it out there I wonder if that's her so that's kind of interesting I don't know maybe the book maybe somewhere in here it solves that more photos John and Yoko, obviously. I hope the YouTube sensors don't catch that one. Great shot from Twickenham Studios. I've seen this one before, I believe. But the, uh, so my hands are really large. Like I'm, I'm not a small guy. My hands are large. This book is a large book. Um, so this shot right here, I mean, this, this is an 18 inch plus image. I mean, it's, it's really, it's big. It's something. I mean, I don't know if this is considered a coffee table book. I wouldn't leave it on the coffee table, but, uh, it's large. And this photo is just in incredibly high quality. I always like looking at the, uh, the cameras that they used. We know the stories about the Niagara reels and such, don't we? That's interesting. Whatever Paul's looking at here. I don't know. I bet, I bet my buddy Dan Rivkin, and I've had Dan on the channel before and talked to him um, on the channel and uh, talked to him about other things before. I think I've talked about him on the channel, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Dan runs a blog called They May Be Parted that really analyzes the Let It Be era uh, and to a certain extent the Abbey Road era of the band. I'm wanting to say that I've seen Dan mention something like this before. Like, you know how us Beatles nerds, like a lot of us kind of sleuth it and we'll, we'll take that image and we'll look at it with other, like through another lens, you know, we'll turn it upside down or we'll do whatever to try to figure out what Paul was looking at that day. I wouldn't be surprised if he's got something like that on his website. There's Ringo's drums with the tea towels on there. So this is of course, Twickenham, January of 69. So, um, you know, they were obviously thinking about the Let It Be record that they were in the middle of creating. Um, the rooftop concert would be at the end of the month. Abbey Road as such wasn't really a, it wasn't the idea yet. So it's not like they were recording the stuff or going through the stuff going, okay, let's make Abbey Road. But some of the songs that ended up on Abbey Road did, did start here. Another Twickenham shot. Another essay, this one's called Track by Track, so I think it's probably gonna walk us through everything that's on here. I don't know if it will walk us through the different takes that are uh, on the bonus discs. We'll get there, we'll see though. So, as you probably know, um, Abbey Road, the album, wasn't recorded entirely at Abbey Road. For one, they were at Trident for some of the sessions. And some of that stuff does appear on these uh, session outtakes. So this is I Want You. It doesn't say I Want You, She's So Heavy. It just says I Want You. Um, and it says regarding Beatles sessions at Trident on the 22nd of February, 69. So context, right? This is three weeks after the rooftop concert. It's not like they took a six-month break and then said, okay, let's do Abbey Road. I mean, it was straight from one project into the next. Now, they did take a little bit of a break 
Um, somebody gonna have to, uh, my timeline's not quite right. I'm wanting to say they took a break March through June. Um, I'll check the chat here in a second after you guys have a second to uh, hash that out again because of the delay. But anyway, they did go straight into recording more songs. And then they, they took a little bit of time off before they formally started back at Abbey Road Studios to record what would eventually become the Abbey Road album. And this essay may tell us some of that. I don't quite know. Some more session sheets with a handwritten note on there that says cut at Apple. I don't know if that is a historical note saying these were cut at Apple or maybe we should cut these at Apple. Or maybe it's a, maybe it's a disc order. Again, the unknown. Like I'm so happy that I didn't spend a lot of time reviewing the stuff and memorizing all this information before I actually get to unbox it, you know, the way that anybody else would. Because you can analyze this stuff to death, and by the time you actually get it in your hands, you don't appreciate it. You don't enjoy it. It's not the way I roll. So yeah, so like I said earlier, track by track, this is going to take us through the tracks on the, uh, on the album, of course, starting with Come Together. So recording notes, almost like Lewis and Style, right? Uh, if you're watching this channel, you probably have the book Recording Sessions by Mark Lewison or The Complete Beatles Chronicle by Mark Lewison. If you don't, Put that on your Christmas list. Ask your mom, ask your wife, ask your cousin, ask your neighbor, ask your dog to buy it for you. Make it happen. Those are, um, what I consider them essential reading for any Beatles fan. Just as a reference point, just to have this stuff around. But this looks like it's taking a page out of that book, almost literally, with a copy of the recording sheet, as you would see in recording sessions. Um, but it looks like this is going to break it down, not only like, Broadly, here's what Come Together is, but it actually mentions, so that's a note in bold right there where it says, da 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 as heard at the end of take five, session CD three, track track one. Session, session CD three, track one. Then over here, same kind of thing. Session, sessions CD three, track one. So that's what this is going to be, this track by track walkthrough. I'm gonna pop back in here in the chat. Some really good conversations happening. Awesome. <laughs> Saul Jr. said, demonetized. Yeah, probably when I showed that Yoko and John photo, huh? It was the backside, not so bad. Uh, Rico USA says, the Here Comes the Sun video release also seemed to have some photos I'd never seen before. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. Gerald Jenkins says, these photos are amazing. Yeah, man, I'm really, really enjoying them. Saul Jr. says, for Christmas, I'm getting Hofner violin bass, so I can't. Yeah, priorities, man. Make music instead of just learning about it. I like it. Very cool, guys. All right, let's get back to it. So that's come together. Oh, yeah, lyric sheet. And I've not seen this one before. I don't know, it might be out there. I mean, it's hard to be comprehensive with the Beatles, right? There's so much, so much to learn, so much to take in. And, you know, who wants to memorize this stuff? It's okay for me. It's okay if anybody wants to take an academic approach. But for this to feel like work is the last thing that I want in my life. You know, I really want to enjoy this, even if I am spending a lot of time editing videos or setting up stuff or, you know, technical things for this channel or whatever. Like, I really enjoy it. Um, but there's some folks out there who I'm afraid sometimes they don't because they analyze it so much. They're like, oh yeah, well, we've already seen that before. We saw it on the 10th of January, December, um, in December of 1973 or whatever, right? So I still get excited with this stuff. This is new to me. Uh, this looks like it was written on stationery. It says up at the top, Bag Productions, 3 Savile Row, London. Bag Productions being a, a little bit of a holding company for John and Yoko. But yeah, yeah. Um, Looks like there's a whole first verse. I'm trying to check it out. Yeah, it was a, a draft at the first verse that was scratched out. But then here's the first verse repeated again. Here come old flat top. He come grooving up slowly. He got juju eyeballs. He's one holy roller. I mean, it's pretty. I don't know if this was in progress. You know, you just never know how that stuff is done. Like, is it in progress on 
restaurant napkins and then they roll it into one sheet like this for when they're actually singing it when they're actually doing the take we don't we don't know unless there are notes that accompany this stuff um but this one looks like it's pretty much in progress you know here we go down here he got monkey finger and then he shoot coca-cola um but it looks like i don't know he make he make hocus pocus again maybe somebody knows about this already but it looks like new info to me so that's it on come together here's something demo version date first version date remake date so demo version recorded 25th of february first version recorded 16th of april so that break that i was talking about earlier um, looks like it was about a nearly a two-month break at least as far as that goes and then the remake was made May of 69, we know Here Comes the Sun, at least I know Here Comes the Sun pretty deeply after doing the uh, big video on it that I did. That was in July of 69. Additional instruments, Billy Preston on organ. I think somebody in the chat was like, hey, where's Billy Preston at? Um, yeah, he's going to get a lot of love in here. He's certainly going to get a lot of love in the Let It Be, the new Let It Be movie, a film, whatever you want to call it. It's not a remake. It's not even a remaster of the Michael Lindsay Hogg thing because that's a separate project. But the thing that Peter Jackson is working on seems like it's going to tell a much lighter story, a much lighter version of the Let It Be story that Michael Lindsay Hogg made. And that was the actual film that came out in 70. But anyway, if you watch that, it doesn't really tell Billy's story. It doesn't tell it enough um, how he essentially became a part of the band. He wasn't just a side player that was brought in for a couple of things. Um, the way that... Uh, George Harrison talks about him in a recent interview that, that I discovered. Uh, March 11th, 1970, I think was the date on that one. It was a BBC interview that George did. And he was talking about Billy Preston like it was his brother. Um, just, you know, nothing but kind words for that guy. So I would imagine that as history kind of writes itself on this stuff and realizes, okay, there were more to the Beatles than the four Beatles. And how many fifth Beatles are there and how many stories do we need to tell? So we know about George Martin. We know about Brian Epstein. Let's dig into the stories of some of these other guys. So Billy Preston being one of them. So here we go. Here's the first mention that I've seen. Uh, additional instruments, Billy Preston, organ recorded 11th of July, 1969. Another great shot of George right there. Here, I'll try to hold it in a different way so that the glare is not killing it. Beautiful image. George kind of has a Jesus vibe going on with that hairstyle, doesn't he? Maxwell Silver Hammer, some original lyrics there. There's another Linda McCartney shot. Man, she was just fantastic, wasn't she? Super, super talented. Um, but Paul with his Epiphone Casino there. Oh, darling. Another lyric sheet. Another Linda McCartney photo. And these look like complete stories of, of these songs. I don't know about their writing. I mean, I'm sure it gives a little bit of context on that. Um, we'll see on Here Comes the Sun, because if you watch that video, the one that I put together was, what, 13 minutes long or whatever. We certainly talked about its writing there. But here's Oh, Darling. The lyric sheet there. So whereas John wrote his on bag one stationary, Paul has written this on something that says the Potlatch Club. Something to look into. If you want a good name for a band, there you go, Potlatch Club. For verse four down here, Paul notes that it's a talking verse. Dot, dot, dot. I'll never do you no harm. So he knew where he was going. Octopus's Garden. And a uh, great shot over here of Ringo actually recording something that wasn't drums, not vocals. He's blowing the bubbles that you can hear in the bridge section. Uh, I read an interview with one of the uh, assistant engineers. I don't really recall who it was. It wasn't Alan Parsons. It wasn't Jeff Emmerich. I think it was one of the, the assistants. But he was talking about how close mic'd that had to be to get the bubbles to sound the right way, which makes sense. So... You know, here I am with my glass of water, with my mic. You know, 
if you're doing that, that's the way you're going to capture that sound. It's not going to work if you're holding it down the way that Ringo is here. But yeah, I can't wait to dig into that and listen to those bubbles again with that photo in mind. I want you. She's so heavy. That is going to be a great story to hear. Uh, we know that it started life at Trident. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And I've not heard this take. Uh, the, of course, I know the song. I have not heard the, the extra take that's included here. I think there's just one. Let's see. Skimming it real quick. It says Ses Sessions CD2 track one. So I'm looking forward to jumping into that. But that would have been from Trident recorded again, 22nd of February, 1969. Yeah, really looking forward to learning more about that. That's a new shot. I've not seen that picture before. Ringo on timpani. Nice floral print shirt. It's the 60s, man. They were post... Um, they were post All You Need Is Love. They were post Sgt. Pepper. So the fashion wasn't maybe as exuberant as it was a couple of years prior, but it was still the 60s. Oh, man. I'm loving these, these full spreads. Four separate shots here. Again, all into McCartney photos. Uh, from the research that I've done, there, there just aren't that many photos from late period Beatles in the studios, unfortunately. Um, so we really have Lennon McCartney to thank for, for capturing this stuff. It really brings it to life, doesn't it? I mean, imagine, imagine this, right? George is almost rocking a man bun. He's got his hair pulled back. Um, I can see somebody walking down, or could imagine somebody walking down the street like that, looking just like that, except for the sunglasses. The sunglasses are kind of a giveaway, but he's got almost uh, Converse Chuck Taylors on there, looking hip. Great shots, especially when you look at this right here, this photo of Ringo. And if you get this, if you get this box set, study this photo. There's a lot here. You see the Drum City logo. These are these drums were new to Ringo uh, for the Abbey Road sessions. His maple kit, he called them. So you still see the tea towel on the drums, um, but seeing the Drum City logo on there. Of course, no bass head, no logo um, logo head on there on the bass. That was one thing that if you're going to be completely I don't know, sycophantic, if you're going to be really picky, it's probably the most charitable, charitable way of saying it, about the Here Comes the Sun video. I was kind of disappointed that they didn't use contemporary instruments in it. So you'll look through there and you'll see Paul's Hofner bass. Well, Paul didn't play his Hofner bass on the Heavy Road Sessions, if, if I recall correctly. I think it was all the Rickenbacker. When he played, you see George with the bass here. That was the Fender. But when Paul played, I think he was mainly just playing the Rick. But it wasn't the Hofner. But Ringo's drums, that was another thing. It had the, uh, the Drop T logo drum head on there. I get it. It's marketing. It's communicating to a newer generation. You know, they don't need to know the ins and outs of really nerdy stuff like that. But still, it, was, uh, it didn't really sync with the time, seeing a 1964 era drum head uh, in 1969. Here comes the sun. Great photo of George. I have seen that one before. Here's a scan of the lyric sheet. As you saw in the Here Comes the Sun video, and this little, this little couple right here, they were brought to life in that new video that just aired yesterday. I'm trying to read this right here. Looks like a poem, poem that's in English and then in Hindu as well, I'm guessing. Sweet. I don't know if this tells the story of George writing it, um, the way that he wrote it at Eric Clapton's. Yep, there it is. The quote right there. Relaxing in the garden with one of Eric's acoustic guitars, here comes the sun, popped into his head. It was just the release of that tension that had been building up on me. It was the first time I'd played guitar for a couple of weeks because I'd been so busy. It just came, it just came and I finished it later when I was on holiday in Sardinia. Fun to see that story told. There's Ringo playing the Moog with George Harrison. And I believe I used that, used that shot in my Here Comes the Sun video. It really gave context to talking about the mode. Here, let me fix this glare issue again so you can see it. And some of that stuff gets a little bit tricky the way that I have to use photo clips and video clips and audio clips. Copyright gets really, really crazy here on YouTube if you are, uh, 
If you're a YouTube creator, you know what I mean. But fair use comes into play. Being sensible comes into play. Um, so yeah, that was one that made a lot of sense because here we are. This is a Moog session. And the Moog featured so prominently on Here Comes the Sun. Yeah, so more stories. Never give me your money. What did I? Oh, I skipped because. I was like, that doesn't make sense. Here Comes the Sun doesn't go into the medley. Cool. Because, and then we start going into the medley. More lyrics written down. I don't mean to fly through this, but by the same token, um, I'm guessing most of you guys are going to be buying this if you haven't already gotten it already. But it's really just, it's fun to walk through it, isn't it? So yeah, lyrics for You Never Give Me Your Money. Oh, huh. So I wonder what the story is on this. So here, I'll show this to you. We'll talk about this for a second. So over here, we actually have lyrics for You Never Give Me Your Money. Out of college, money spent, see no future, pay no rent. But over here, we've got some of that, but we also have a lot of song titles. Makes me wonder if that's not part of building the medley. You Never Give Me Your Money, next line, out of college, dot, 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 one sweet dream, the Sun King, yeah, this is, this is medley being worked out. So before the long one, right, before that draft was put together, I'm guessing something like this was just hashed out on paper. The Sun King, mean, mean Mr. Mustard. By the way, the Sun King. It's kind of funny to see it like that, isn't it? Mean Mr. Mustard, Her Majesty, Polythene Pam. She came in through the bathroom window. Once there was a way, golden slumbers carry that weight. I'll never give you my pill. I never give you my pillow. Carry that weight. So, yeah, hopefully this, this book really details the story of the long one, the medley, both the draft and the final. I'm sure it explains Her Majesty and the running order. Curious what this means. It's obviously Mean Mr. Mustard written out. Arthur Alex, voice ditto. I don't know what that note means. I'll have to look it up. This is always a learning experience for us, isn't it? Polythene Pam slash she came in through the bathroom window. Looks like the story is being told at once. Um, and again, bathroom window. There's the potlatch club again. Another Linda McCartney photo. Great shot of John there. Golden slumbers carry that weight. And these are scans of tape boxes that they used at EMI. So if you look on there, you know, you'll have the different takes. Um, some of them are going to be outtakes and maybe not demos, but, you know, studio demos maybe. Um, and then as they were stringing everything together, piecing it together, this is what the master tapes would look like. This is how they would be noted. So for instance, it says the Beatles right here. Rough stereo remix. Starting off with You Never Give Me Your Money, Sun King. Her Majesty scratched out. Polythene Pam, bathroom window, golden slumbers, ending. And then Her Majesty at tape's end, I think is what that says. Yeah, Her Majesty after end. And there's a note on there that says, now on master tape. Golden slumbers. Lyric sheet written on Apple stationery. It's kind of hard to see, but worth a gander. And the end. Called on the tape box ending, the recording of the final part of the long medley was started before the sessions for here for Sun King, mean Mr. Mustard and Polythene Pam. She came in through the bathroom window. So that's interesting to me. But let's go back here to the tape box. Sure enough, it says ending, so not the end. Oh, this is fantastic. I'm a music nerd. I wish I was more of a musician, but I played trombone for 10 years. I was in the band, so seeing a score like this is not foreign to me. But this is George Martin's score for the end. 30-piece orchestra, if I recall correctly, off the, just off the top of my head. 
Really cool seeing that produced in, in that kind of high resolution, high quality. That's awesome. And Her Majesty. With a cool little note here that says, see mean Mr. Mustard details for musician for... Oh, okay. See mean Mr. Mustard details for musicians on the chord at the beginning. Because technically, that chord at the beginning isn't just Paul and guitar, of course. Very cool. All right. Let's take a break right here. And I'm going to see what's going on in the chat room again, guys. Thank you again for joining me. This is a lot of fun to uh, not only share this with with anybody who's watching the channel, just because it's you know channel and subscribers and blah blah blah, but just because it's other Beatles fans, it's really fun to dig into stuff like this. Looking back at the last few minutes of comments, Rick Jangle says they'll still be doing reviews on the Beatles in another hundred years' time. Completely agree. I have a video so. If you've been, if you subscribe to the channel and if you don't, please do subscribe to the channel. But if you do, you've probably been seeing the Beatles news updates that I've done weekly for the last six weeks. Well, this is episode six coming out and I think I skipped a week in there when there was not much going on, but I'm publishing a new episode number six sometime tonight that talks about what this week has looked like. And one thing I'm mentioning in there is the Ken Burns country music series. And I'm not a huge, huge country music fan. I did kind of grow up on it. I lived in Nashville for a while, so I'm familiar with that world. Um, but I was thinking, Ken Burns has covered so much. He has covered jazz. He's covered baseball. He's covered the Civil War. He's now covered country music, which has to be his most recent work. Um, and that series stops at 1996, I think, by the way. So it doesn't go into the 2000s. So if you're thinking, you know, Taylor Swift or whatever, it doesn't really touch that. But for, for somebody like Ken Burns to do a 16-hour documentary on country music, and he's starting, I think, in the teens is probably when the documentary starts. You know, he goes way back to old folk, old mountain music, where we imported some of that, that stuff from. But he's analyzing stuff that happened more than 100 years ago and then turning around and going, okay, now what happened 20 years ago? So huge swath there, but it's 16 hours. But I firmly believe that people will be going, okay, now how did the Beatles influence this, this player, this singer or whatever in 20 years time, 40 years time? Um, I, don't, I don't say that just because I'm a fan. I say that because it, you would be hard pressed to find talent today and I use that word loosely, you would be hard to find an artist today that isn't somehow affected by the Beatles, even if it's tangentially. So I completely agree with that thought. You, you guys don't have to hear me on my soapbox, but yeah, that's a, that's a point that I completely agree with. Davy or Davy Alfredo says, I really want the Abbey Road Super Deluxe 2019 mix. I already listened to most of it on Spotify, but I really want all the things that come with the physical edition, including this book. This book is fantastic. Um, you just have to decide for you. You know, is it is it an investment piece? Is it worth it for you to plunk down 90 bucks US dollars uh, for this? I don't know. The good news is you can probably find a used copy in a few months' time and you can pay... 50 bucks for it. That's just the way this stuff goes. Um, the Sergeant Pepper box set is much cheaper now. So if you can hold off a little bit, that's probably what I would recommend unless you just really want to throw the money at it. And I think a lot of us fans are those people. Rico USA says, anyone know when, the, when Mark Lewison's next Beatles book will be released? His next tome. Great word. Um... No, I, I don't think we know. I don't think Mark has said there was some, there were some ramblings. Um, I think when the first edition, when the first volume came out that he was shooting for 2020 or 2021 for volume two, I could have that wrong or that could have been his goal. And then now it's, it's not happening. I don't know. I would love for it to come out next year, but I haven't heard anything. And I think we probably would have, unless they're just really keeping it under wraps this time, which is awesome. All right, let's jump back in. That is definitely a new photo for me. I've not seen Ringo wearing 
either a necktie or a bandana or some other kind of hippie headdress in those days. I haven't seen that photo though. These are cool shots, um, but they're not as high quality as the black and white ones that we saw earlier. They're a little muddy. They're a little, not even grainy. They're just a little muddy, almost like they were cropped in a little bit too much, or maybe Linda was a little out of focus, or I'm not a photographer, but maybe it was the, the type of film she was using. I don't know, but not quite as nice as, you know, if we go back to that shot, for instance. So now we get kind of on the outer edges of Abbey Road. So we're out of the actual Abbey Road album, but these were either recorded around the time of Abbey Road um, or maybe initially intended for Abbey Road and it just didn't come to fruition. So Mary Hopkin ended up recording that song, but Paul's demo is on the collection. And I've heard that uh, on demos for years and years and years, but I would imagine that it sounds incredible on this collection, in this collection. The Ballad of John and Yoko, that's interesting that that's a part of this. Um, I had heard, because I glanced at a track list, uh, I'd heard that this was in there, but uh, yeah, so I haven't heard it yet. I'm really curious to hear what's different about it, because the way that it was recorded, just being John and Paul, where they built it up. So I don't know if it's, if it's a different take, and you guys probably know this, but again, there's a lot that I kind of, I wanted the surprise, I wanted the shock. So I'm guessing that if this isn't a different take, this is kind of the buildup. So we hear maybe the initial take of John and Paul playing, what would it have been? Not piano, drums and guitar, I guess, because it would have been not piano and not bass, not maracas. Here we go. Sessions, CD two, track four is take seven, preceded by some speech from earlier in the reel. Where the take three had speeded up during their performance, John advised Paul, it got a bit faster, Ringo, because of course we know Paul played drums on that track, right? Okay, George, Paul replied, sharing the joke. That's nice. Take 10 was chosen as the one to receive a series of overdubs, but Paul was not sure about it at first. I thought the others were better, he told John. What'd you think in there? John asked the team in the control room. John and Paul tried another take in a higher key, G, instead of E, but eventually settled on take 10. All right, so it is a different take is what it sounds like. Well, it goes on to tell the story. I'll leave that as a surprise for both me and you. Old Brown Shoe. I've always liked that song. George's vocal has always had some kind of swirly effect, and I'm just now thinking about this. It's always sounded a little muddy, a little processed to me. It sounds cool, but um, yeah, I'm trying to think, like, why does that sound fuzzy in my head? I have to figure it out, and I'm curious if this sounds the same or if this is like a, uh, a breakdown take or what, but I'm curious if George's vo voice will sound as muddy or if it's clearer. It's a good shot of the band with Yoko and Ringo smoking a cigarette with a cigarette holder, apparently. Interesting shot. Photo by Linda McCartney. Yeah, Linda's all over this. This is, this is cool. Come and get it. There's a quote by Paul. Please don't change this. I can guarantee it's a hit for Badfinger. And he was right. Great shot of Abbey Road right there. No, the stream didn't freeze. I'm just, I'm taking it in. <laughs> Man, the world would have changed if it had been that car instead of the Volkswagen, right? Somebody would have come up with some kind of conspiracy theory based off of that license plate instead of what we got. Cool photo. Very cool photo. The cover. So this... This is going to be an essay on how the cover was made. Here's George with those really, really far out sunglasses, man. Check those out. And see, now we see them in color. We know that they were orange. Let's 
outtakes from the session. So this photo, for instance, by Linda McCartney, but this one would have been by, oh man, I've forgotten his name, Ian. Somebody's going to have to help me out. Ian, why do I want to say McGregor? That's Ian McGregor. Ian McMillan, there we go. Oh, I said, I was thinking McMillan. The Arrival of Abbey Road, another essay. Sounds like this was just piecing it together and promoting it, and releasing it. Oh yeah, so like for instance, this right here. Asked about his favorites from the LP on BBC Radio. B BBC Radio 1's Seen and Heard in September of 1969. Paul replied, well, I like, to I like Come Together. That's a great one, which is John's one. I like something, George writes. And I like Because on the second side. There's not a bad track on it, but my favorites are those ones. And then the long one. He's still calling it the long one here. I like it. It was never officially called the long one, but it is here in this collection. And in the end. Some promo stuff. Some stills from the something video. One way to promote Abbey Road. Capital relieves nervous tension three ways. One, on record. Two, on eight track. Three, on cassette. <laughs> I mean, I love, I love Abbey Road. Relieving nervous tension. I don't know, maybe it has done that. There's the wall at Abbey Road, which I've not been to. It's on my bucket list. Something I've got to do. This is a very recent photo. There's a date of May 29th, 2019. June 2019. There's another June. And if I recall correctly, I think... Here, let me go back to it. So, the sticker that I kicked off with, the sticker right here, Made in Germany. It's got a date right there. Of, I'm guessing that's the European way of doing dates, not the American way, because in America that would be January 8th, but in Europe that would be the 1st of August. So if that's the production date on that. When you think about it, putting together a book like this, putting together, uh, I mean, I'm guessing the music was done, but just the book and the package and everything like that, taking this photo in June, then producing the book on August, it's a quick turn. Just something to think about the way that all this stuff would be produced. Again, full spread right there. Oh, great photo, man. At John's estate in Tittenhurst. The last photo, photo session. Another track listing breakdown. So two CDs of sessions. And that's the way that it's described, you know, as if you look at come together, it'll say, you know, CD two, take five, um, or CD three, whatever it is. There you go. CD three, take five, track one. Very cool. I'm looking forward to giving it a good hearty listen tonight. More liner notes. And the thank yous and all this fun stuff. 2019 mixes. Producer Giles Martin, mix engineer Sam O'Kell. Sessions mixed by Giles Martin, Chris Sheldon, and Sam O'Kell. The Abbey Road crew that's had a lot to do with this. There you go. Images. Linda McCartney, Linda McCartney all over the place. Couple by Yoko. Let's see which, which one that one is. I'm just curious. Page 14 left. Copyright Yoko Ono. I knew Yoko took some photos in these sessions. And I've seen them, but it's always fun to see which ones actually made the grade. Um, so... <laughs> that one again. Watch out, YouTube censors. Um, so it's copyright Yoko Ono. She didn't take it, though. So I guess that's a little different there. Handwritten documents copyrighted. Some by Yoko. Some by Hair Songs Limited. Some by Paul McCartney. And page 57, The Estate of George Martin. I'm assuming that would be the score for the end. 
Yep. If you guys hear that jangling in the background, that is my dog, Sadie. And Sadie might be ready to listen to Abbey Road as well. And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. That's how they close out the book. Then the two CDs of Sessions with... This is a happy little surprise. This is similar to what they did with Pepper. With alternate covers. It's hard to hold the right way. So photos that you've probably seen before if you're a bit of a diehard fan. But it's kind of neat to have CDs. I mean, it's, it's totally appropriate, right? Because they're session discs. And they include all these outtakes. And these are outtake photos. From Ian McGregor McMillan. All right. Can't wait to dig in. Back cover. We talked about that. All right, that's it, you guys. Now I'm going to hang out with you in the chat room for a little bit. Let's see, what if I do something like this right here? Does this work? Oh, yeah, I can do that right there. Make myself a little bit bigger. Now I wish I could throw up the chat. I'll have to figure out how to do that next time we do this. All right. Ray says, I thought the jangle in the background was from our cat's collar. Yeah, no, that's, that's Sadie. Sadie is our 12-year-old golden retriever. And she's actually, actually caused some problems over the years. Uh, she will, she'll jangle in the background while I'm recording a voiceover or doing some other work for, uh, for the videos. And I'll have to edit it out because I think it's one thing if it's a live stream like this, right? But if it's like I'm getting serious and I'm explaining, explaining to the audience, you know, here's what happened on take 57 or whatever it looks like. And Sadie's back there going, jangle, jangle. Reyes also says, now you need a protective dust jacket. Yeah, it'll, it'll end up on the bookshelf, bookshelf with Sgt. Pepper and the White Album and all that stuff. It's protected, not from dust, unfortunately. Salt Jr. says, good dog name. Yeah, I mean, you wonder where it comes from, right, Sadie? Which was funny when we named her. I didn't know any other dogs named Sadie. Now you hear her clapping around. I didn't know any other dogs names. Bug, bug, come here. Sadie, come. She's 12. She's going to ignore me, and that's okay. Uh, we didn't know any other Sadies at the time, uh, but then it's become really popular, but I just did it for the Beatles connection. had nothing to do with anything else. Katie says, Abbey Road is brilliant, and they did really good on the track. Man, it's amazing, but I... Again, I can't wait to listen to the sessions. Maybe I can wait because I'm hanging out with you guys right now. Uh, Richard Kenmore says, what kind of headphones do you like? Um, I'll show you. So these are not my usual like listening headphones, but these are amazing for video work and some of the, the editing work and that kind of thing that I do. They're the Sony MDR7506. Um, they're workhorses. They sound really clear. They don't color sound. They're not particularly warm uh, for music listening, but for for like video editing and everything, it's right on. Like you want it to, you want it to sound as um, as natural as possible, right? Like you don't want any kind of EQing built into whatever the speakers and stuff sound like. Um, but for listening, I've got I've got an old pair of uh, Shure earbuds that I really like. I know it sounds cheesy, but I've had them for five years. And I've got I've got one more pan, one more pair of over the ears, and I can't remember who made those. Um, I think they're Sennheisers, Sennheisers QE three or something like that. Uh, it's not they're not the Bose QC two or whatever it is, but I really like Sennheiser stuff. Um, but I swear by those Sure earbuds; they're fantastic. Tony's got the Sony one thousand MX three. Fill me in again sometime, man. Uh, 300D 300 300 D Turbo 1987 says, I missed it. When can I get it again? If you're talking about this video, as soon as I end this stream, I don't know if it'll have to process or whatever, but very quickly after I end the stream, um, you should be able to see this video on my channel. You can go to fab4archivist.com and it just takes you straight to my YouTube channel. Scroll back up and see if I missed anything. 
kind of a nerdy question, but how did the technical quality work on this? I tried some things that I hadn't done before for live streams. I did kind of the two camera thing mainly. So this right here, so it, you guys weren't just looking at me talk with my hands. I wanted to have kind of that two camera thing. Um, and then using the good mic for this. I just want to make sure everything worked well, that it wasn't laggy or glitchy or anything like that for you guys. Paul Lavelle, so this is going back seven minutes ago. We do the day, month, year, because it's logic. Completely agree. There's a lot that I'm like hardcore, super America, yeah, on date is not one of them. Um, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Now, I guess you do say September 27th, 2019, and I, I don't know what, Europeans or what the rest of the world says. That's what we say around here. So that's probably why it's 92719 for here. Um, but, you know, when you're actually writing it out, uh, including the year, it totally makes sense to do day, month, year. I get it. Tony Fox, going back to what you said a little bit ago, Her Majesty in the middle of the long one is like an intermission. A good intermission or a bad intermission? I'm trying to think of the way that it sounds. And if I recall correctly, again, without having listened to this yet, if I recall correctly, that intermission sucks the energy out of it. Not that you don't have, you know, the, the ballads and not that you don't have, you know, the ups and the downs and the tempos. You've already got that swing. It's not like it's just driving the whole time. But Her Majesty, just Paul on guitar, you know, Blackbird style or Yesterday style or Her Majesty style, it's... Um, it's so unlike everything else that's a part of the medley that if I recall correctly, like the energy just kind of drops, which might be why Paul pulled it out and just said, hey, add it to the tape. Don't throw it away, but just add it to the tape. And voila, there it was. It's kind of the uh, hidden track. So I don't know. I don't know if it would be a positive intermission, but, you know, to each his own. I'll have to listen to it again. Jeff said, perfect stream. Glad it worked out well. That's awesome. Uh, Ralph Simpson DeMarco says year, month, day is what archivists use year, month, day, honestly, within my file. So you know, the reason that my channel, so we're going way back now, but the reason that my channel is called fat for archivist is because it started and you've, if you've seen me do live streams before, or like this kind of off the cuff thing, you've heard me talk about this before. Um, the reason that the channel is called fat for archivist is because it started in 2008 and I uploaded bootlegs and you can't do that now. I didn't really know what I was doing. I just thought I'd share my, my collection with people and I'd get like hundreds of thousands and millions in some cases of views on some of these, these bootlegs and, uh, the copyright police crack down on that stuff and totally get it. I, it's in all fairness, I get it, whatever. It's not my content to share. So that's fine. But anyway, that's the reason that it was that I named the channel just fat for archivist out of the blue in 2008 is because I had this archive of, of, bootlegs and some video outtakes and that kind of thing. It was fun to share it. So I just came up with the archivist thing in my archives, the way that all that stuff is, is kept. I've got it sorted in that date order. So year, month, date, which is, I mean, it totally makes sense, right? Like if you're looking at these Lennon McCartney photos and you want to figure out the 27th of, of September versus the 26th, you don't want to come across photos taken on that same day in 1967 versus 69. So it makes sense to start out with the year. Car business, you start out with the year. Totally get it. Dweeb says, the Let It Be 2020 mix will be 10 plus discs with all the outtakes and studio jams that they got. I don't know, man. You never know. Um, I hope they go whole hog with it. You know, there's been a, a decent amount of talk in the Beatles world about this collection, how they didn't really include a whole lot. And I think the response that Apple would say, or that Giles Martin would say is there's not a whole lot there. They kind of came to the studio ready and there aren't a whole lot of takes that fell apart. There certainly aren't a lot of complete remakes of songs. Like they knew what they wanted. And don't forget the Beatles had been doing this for eight years at this point. They knew what they wanted when they walked into the studio or seven years. You know what I mean? Um, but they knew what they wanted. They'd been doing it long enough so that they walked in with a song that was pretty much ready, pretty much didn't have to be, you know, completely written within the studio. So there's not a lot here. Will they turn the corner? Will they go back to essentially what they did with Sergeant Pepper and release just this treasure trove of all kinds of stuff uh, for Let It Be? 
I don't know. It depends on probably how well that one sold and how well this one's going to sell. Um, you know, White Album, Sgt. Pepper, those box sets were quite a bit more expensive. Um, so I don't know. It probably depends on sales because they've got to make it worth their worth, worth their while as well, right? But I don't know. Then again, you only have a 50th anniversary once, so why not? Why not just go crazy with it? L or Le, I'm sorry. Music says probably that's why Paul wanted it out, not energetic enough, but it sounds interesting. Yeah, completely agree. I, that's that's what I would think. The Zapster says, honestly, though, they should add the Let It Be movie as a disc for the Super Deluxe, or at least a box set similar to that of the Magical Mystery Tour from 2012. Yeah, the we don't know what that looks like yet, so they haven't even announced anything besides they. Uh, Peter Jackson is is doing his film, um, which is a it's a, a remake. I mean, he's he's going back to 50 hours of footage, so Peter Jackson is going to that to re. To, to, I guess, cut a new film. I don't even want to say recut or remake or anything like that. Um, alongside that, they are remastering and restoring uh, the original Let It Be film. So they are seeing those as two separate entities. So that's really good for fans. How they will be released and will they be released with within the context of like a musical box set? We don't know that yet. Um, surely... They're just gonna they're gonna pummel us with tons of content. Maybe especially after Abbey Road, which is their swan song, if you ask me. But there was less content, um, and therefore I think there there was less of a promotional effort around this one. So I don't know. Maybe we'll just go insane um, come March. That'll be a couple of months before the February or before the May fiftieth anniversary of Let It Be. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up around here. Make sure there's nobody else in the chat saying, hey, don't go yet. Like the last minute questions or anything like that. Yeah, guys, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for joining me on this. Um, this has been a lot of fun. You know, it's not every day that we get to celebrate uh, an anniversary of an album like this, especially, you know, being able to walk through all the bonus content and that stuff. This has been a lot of fun. I'm a huge Beatles fan. You guys are Beatles fans. You, you get this stuff. So it's fun being with uh, like-minded folks. Thank you so much for everything that you've brought to the channel, whether it's your comments or just liking it or subscribing or whatever. This really is a labor of love for me. And I do put a lot of time and uh, energy and stuff into it. So it's nice that uh, it seems to be catching on with a lot of folks. Um, yeah, so and a live stream is kind of just an extension of that. This is mainly just for fun. I, I take the, the video essays and the news and all that stuff, but I take, I take it a little more seriously. But this is really fun to do this kind of thing with you guys. Maybe we'll do it more often. All right, thanks again for watching. We'll see you all next time.